live. I believe we are live. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm hoping that you can hear me. Ping me a message if you can. I'm going to just set it up on my phone so I can see any comments. No, I think that's just we click that at the end. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's recording, so we're just waiting for you to come up on phone so we can answer any questions. So it's live there. Just going to check we've got comments in there. Shall we start? Yeah, I think we're done. Right, okay. We're hoping there's some people watching. Oh, we've got seven people watching. Fantastic. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> So, go ahead, Julie. Hello, I'm Julie. I'm a maternity support worker here at Hot Cotswold Birth Centre, Richard Norton. There's um, five of us. Who's the six? No, it's five. Five, five, five maternity five support workers, yeah. So, lots of us here ready to help you. Um, so, I'm Sharon. I'm one of the maternity support workers based here at the Cotswold Birth Centre. Um, our key role really is helping you guys after you've had your babies. Um, so that's what we're hoping to help you with today. Um, we're going to do things slightly different because it's just myself and Julie. There aren't any midwives in the room as, as we speak at the moment. Hopefully they'll join us later. But what we thought is we'd do two scenarios for you today. So we're going to start off with doing a very simple pathway of um, everything's normal, what you expect to be happening in that first week with your baby. And then we'll go into a second scenario where we do something a bit more complex and where you require a bit more help and a bit more support. Um, and we'll bring into it nappies and we'll bring into safe sleeping and we'll talk about size of effective feeding, etc, etc. So I would love to see some questions coming up on there. What we think we'll probably do is we're going to answer your questions at the end of the session, if that's all right, just so that we can go through the scenarios first. Right, so Julie's going to be my new mummy. Okay. So Julie has delivered at the John Radcliffe, we'll say, and she's had a normal vaginal delivery and um, she's had lovely skin to skin with her baby immediately after delivery. Um, baby's feeding really well and she's gone home and one of the, the lovely midwives in the outing community is her midwife and she's come to see her. So I'm going to play that part of that midwife today. So I've come across to see Julie at home and we've observed a feed and I'm asking Julie how things are going. And how do you think the baby's been feeding, Julie? Do you know she's feeding really well? Good, good. Really well, I'm not sore, she's a happy baby. Fantastic, and you're seeing that she's sucking and swallowing? Yeah, well, okay. I can hear her sometimes. Fantastic. So when we come to see you, we want to check that really everything's going well. Now, if we felt that actually we hadn't observed a feed and that baby wasn't struggling really sort of with attachment and mum just needed a bit of a support, we may then ask you to come into the unit for some support. So that would be the first thing that we would offer is some extra support in between that, that next day five visit. So you may come up to the unit and have a bit of breastfeeding support. And we would talk through things. Now, Julie's come up and she's seen us at the unit and everything's great and we've now booked her a day five appointment. So the next appointment you would have would be that day five appointment and that's when we do the heel prick test. So we're checking for genetic disorders. I'm going to go into the detail a bit more on the next scenario about that. Um, we've checked that, that weight to see how baby's doing and baby's weight is absolutely fine. So we've had a chat with Julie and we've said, do you want to come in on day seven for a bit of support, Julie? Or do you feel you're happy to see your midwife on day 10 for discharge? I'd like to come in. Okay, so Julie's going to take us up and she's going to come into the unit for some extra support. We would then reweigh baby on day seven and then we would then hence her an own appointment for day 10. So that's a normal sort of pathway of care. So we would see you and offer you support as and when you require it. You'd also be having a hearing appointment. So that may have been done at the John Radcliffe. So did, did, was that done at the John Radcliffe? Um, no, it wasn't. Okay, so, so we need to make sure. In the community. So we need to make sure that we've got that in place for Julie and her baby. Um, we then would make sure that you are passed across to the health visitor, and we would make sure that they're aware of how you're doing, how baby's feeding, if mum needs any extra support, etc., etc. We also would talk about safe sleeping, so we're going to go into a bit more detail with that in the next scenario. And also we would talk about um, how you're feeling in yourself, um, things like um, 
sex and contraception, um, whether you've registered baby with the doctors, whether you've registered baby and got the birth certificate all done, etc., etc. So, have I missed anything? I think that's it, isn't it, for a normal bog standard pathway. So this time round, we're going to introduce George, and Judy's going to play the part of another mother today. And this time round, we're going to talk about things where it becomes a little bit more complex, when you may require a bit more support. So I've come out to see Julia at home with baby George, and I'm noticing that George has got a bit of a yellow tinge on his body. And if I look at his eyes, he's got a yellow tinge in his eyes. So what we would offer with that situation is we'd say, OK, let's, let's do a check on baby with a little light monitor. So we should have brought the light monitor in with us, shouldn't we? So ordinarily, we would just dab this little light monitor on baby's chest three times, and it gives us a reading. And that reading tells us exactly where your baby is on a pathway and whether that baby requires any light treatment or whether we're just going to closely monitor it for a little while longer. So sometimes, if that jaundice level is high, we would do something called an SBR, which is when we do a little heel prick test, and we take a small sample of blood, we spin it in a centrifuge, and it gives us a more accurate reading than our billimeters. So that's another thing that we may offer. So if Julie's baby, George, has got jaundice, we would then keep a very close eye on it, and make sure that that jaundice passes. So what sort of things could we do, Julie, do you think, to make sure that that jaundice passes? Plenty of food. Yeah, lots of food, lots of feeding. Lots of feeding. Yeah. And, um, yeah, get help with feeding, because it can make them a little bit sleepy too, which we can give you some tips on what to do about that. Re so regular feeding. So we would offer you support, so we'd like to see if you could come in, so we can spend a little bit of time with you making sure that baby's feeding well. We would then also make sure that we're keeping a check on that jaundice levels. Now jaundice is very normal in newborns, we see it a lot, don't we? And it just needs to pass through the system. So later on, if we felt that sort of by day 14, if your baby was full gestation, if we felt that that jaundice was still at quite a high level, we have the opportunity to send you off to a prolonged jaundice appointment. And what they're looking at there is they could, they'll do a urine test and they'll also do a small blood test just to make sure that nothing's underlying, there's no other conditions. Um, jaundice is a common thing and the best thing we can do is just feed, 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 feed. So we take all the feed and help and support we can in the early days just to make sure that we can get that jaundice well on its way out of the system. So, okay, so we've checked the jaundice. We've now had lovely George in for his day five appointment and we use a little lancet, okay? So in the past, it always used to be a tiny little pinprick and it was like blood getting out of the stone, wasn't it? It was really hard, we'd have to squeeze the foot to get the blood to flow. Nowadays, this lancet is a line and it press it against the skin and it works really, really well at giving us four lovely blood spots. So if I show you, if Julie puts George over her shoulder, fantastic. Come on, George. And we get baby in a lovely comfortable position and make sure that mum's happy, not too hot and bothered, which is difficult at the moment, isn't it? And we just literally put the lancet against the foot and this works very much like blotting paper. So we have all of your details on here, well baby's details, and we literally hover below, we collect four blood spots and we then send that off. And then that comes back pretty much within five days if there's any concerns. If there isn't any concerns, no news is good news. So we are checking for complex illnesses, um, cystic fibrosis, hypothyroidism, sickle cell, and various others. We cannot remove any of them conditions, but what we can do is make sure that we create a nice plan with you for baby for the best outcome long term. Okay, so whilst we're also doing that day five appointment, when we're doing the heel prick test, we're looking at baby's weight, and we also have this. Now, you get given this, at birth and it's very important that every appointment you attend you make sure you bring this with you because for us it's a bible it tells us everything that's been happening with you and each time myself one of the metallic and julie one of the metallic support workers sees you we'll be doing baby's weight we'll be checking to see how feeding's going and we're documenting it in here and also the midwives sometimes will feel your tummy or they'll need to do blood pressure or they may need to take bloods 
and they'll also be documenting it in here. But for you guys at home, the most important page really, if you're breastfeeding, and bottle feeding in the early days, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's just to show exactly what should be happening, what's the normal. So for this instance, we're going to change it slightly. So this baby's coming on day five, and this baby has had quite a big weight loss. So then what we would do is we'd like to see if we can get baby feeding. We'd see if we can change the way that the position is and make sure that baby feeds a bit more effectively. And we would then say, let's bring George back in two days and we'll have another look at that weight and see if we've improved any. If that weight loss was really high, we may contemplate issuing a pump and seeing if we can get you pumping and maybe topping up with some extra express breast milk if required. So we've got lots and lots of different ways that we could look after you during that, that time. Also on day five, we will be looking at the belly button. So we have a beautiful little cord clamp here to show you. So we have two at delivery. So one goes on the cord and the other one goes closer to the baby's belly. And I don't know if you can see that, should we tip it up a little bit? This one remains with you. And as you can see, it's quite clumpy, it's quite hard. So what we say is, is to pull the nappy down to make sure that it can breathe and so that it can be dried out by an air. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever had a scab on your knee and it sits there and if you get it wet, it gets a bit soft and it takes a while to go away. Exactly the same with the cord, isn't it, Julie? That if they leave that alone and we keep it nice and air dry and we don't rush to get it wet, we don't bath, that cord clamp will fall off and we often find it in the baby grows, don't we, when we're taking the, the clothing off of the baby to weigh them. Some people will keep it, some people will throw it away, um, but they're quite glad to see the back of it. So sometimes it can come off on day three, sometimes it doesn't come off until as late as day 14, would you mm -hmm. say? Yeah. So, um, so that's cord care. Now we don't have to do anything with it, we literally leave it alone. If there's any signs of infection, it's quite clear cut, isn't it? Oh, do, yeah. do you want to talk about that? Yeah. We often look, it's the smell. We would smell it if it's infected. It can sometimes look infected and it's not because it, it can be, it is rotten skin in a way. So um, it just needs to be left alone. And as, as Sharon said, nappy back, fresh air, perfect for it. So if you're at home, um, baby grandma vest open, nappy foggy back, and you'll be surprised how quickly that will dry up. Fantastic. So we're going to talk more about babies today, but on day five, it's quite normal that we see you coming in and you're quite emotional. Um, it can be quite an emotional roller coaster ride. So we are here with the tissues and the tea on day five. We quite expect you to come in quite, quite upset. It's all of a sudden, it hits us, doesn't it? That mm. This baby is 100% reliable and responsive to us. And also, you know, we've had lack of sleep, we've had that euphoria of having a baby, and now all of a sudden we're sleep deprived. Gone, it? So it's quite normal that we're expecting to see you to come in on that day and be quite upset. What we say is, is that we should see signs of improvement in that, how you're feeling. If it doesn't, then it's really important you speak to your midwife, but you know, day five, we, we, we quite expect that, that's not abnormal. So don't apologize ever if you come in and you're in tears, we, we quite welcome that. So day five, so this baby's lost a bit of weight, so we really are going to get you back in to make sure that you've got that support and make sure that we can check to see everything's heading in the right direction. So newborn babies should gain weight from day five. So sometimes we see babies come in on day five and they've lost a bit of weight, and that's absolutely fine. What we're looking from day five onwards is that your baby is slowly gaining weight. So by day, day 10, day 14, we're looking for baby to be back or around birth weight. And in some cases, um, these babies absolutely surprise us, haven't lost any weight at all, and have gained oodles by day 10 and are way above their birth weight. But that's what we're looking at, is we're just looking to make sure that baby's doing well and that feeding's going well. Now, another thing that we would be very closely looking at is how your baby is weaning, how your baby is pooing, and how your baby's responding. So we talk a lot about responsiveness with our babies. So we're making sure that by day five, your baby's had a lovely yellow poo. So let's talk about what happens before that, shall we? Yeah? I don't know if I've got these in the right order. Let's have a look. Yeah, so do you want to show that one, Julie? So <laughs> talk about a bit about meconium. Oh, George, you lay there a minute. So meconium. 
Can you see? First poos the baby does. Really sticky. Um, getting rid of all that from inside. Um, that's the first colour. And then I'm going to go it to starts to change with feeding. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> Hopefully you can see that. It's a bit That's mint saucy, that yeah. one. Smells mint saucy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that it goes then to green. Very normal. And then usually by day five, it's... Corma, often people <laughs> say, or mustard. Grainy mustard. So, if Julia came in with her baby on day five and the poos were still green, We'd be making sure that we are following that through with you. So we probably would put you down for a call for the next day and see if there's any change in that. If still on that day we still haven't had any yellow poos, we may say, OK, let's pop in. Let's have a little bit of a look. Let's see if we can get baby feeding a bit more. Um, what goes in has to come out. So realistically, a good yellow nappy is what we're looking for. So we would make sure that we're following that through with you. So we also have something called urates that sometimes we might see in them early days. Um, this isn't the best image for you. I'm not sure how clear that's going to be on there. We don't really want to see that after day three. And it almost looks a bit orangey, a bit like brick dust. Um, it can just mean that sometimes baby just need, requires a little bit more fluid. So we don't really want to see that later on. Now, we've got George here. But if we have a little girl, sometimes we have a little mini pu periods, little pseudo periods. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there might be a spot of blood in the nappy. Um, sometimes boys have been known to do it as yeah. well, haven't they? Um, so sometimes if you notice a little bit of blood in the nappy and it's not from the cord clamp, um, you can always take a photograph of it or you can just mention it to your midwife if you're concerned at all. Um, okay, so nappies. What we do say is make sure when you're putting a nappy on that you've, um, you're aware of how that nappy works. So on most nappies, you'll see that there's a little line down the front. Now, if that nappy gets wet, that line changes to blue. So we can see that baby's had a really good wee. And we do tend to ask people that a lot. Has your baby had a good wee? How many wees has it had? How many poos has it had? And when your baby's had a poo, it's quite hard to tell. So if you get one of your dry nappies, if you're using disposable nappies, completely different if you're using cloth and biodegradable nappies. But if you're using one of these, put a couple of tablespoons of water in it and just give it a squidge, because that'll give you a clear idea of sort of how wet that nappy is. So day five. So we've looked at the weight. We've done our heel prick test. We've checked how mum's feeding. Um, the infant feeding team will go through exactly what's the normal and how the pathway works for feeding. But for me, at this point in time, I would be wanting to make sure that Julie was comfortable, that her nipples weren't sore, and I'd be giving her advice about that if she required that. Um, I'd be making sure that her mental health is good, that she's feeling well in herself, and that she felt well supported here and at home. Going on to that. So, dads. <laughs> We always get asked, don't we, Julie, on day five, what can dads do to help? They can't breastfeed, absolutely fine, we understand that, but what can they do to help? They can do lots, can't they? They can yeah. really look after you. Don't, don't be embarrassed or don't you know, ask if they don't do it. I mean, they don't do the shopping, they can do the cooking. You haven't got to think anything other than yourself and your baby. And it can be hard work in the first few days, so spoil yourself and let them, everybody else spoil you as well. I think that's the difficult thing, isn't it? We still think that actually we'll just carry on regardless, and actually sleep deprivation can be really, really hard. Mm. So it's really important that you get some power naps during the day. You know, it's amazing how much like 30 minutes of a, a break uh, with you just sitting with your eyes closed can make all the difference in the world. Now. Dads will often want to say, okay, you look absolutely exhausted, Julie. Mm -hmm. Go and have a sleep. Go and have a, you know, a sleep upstairs and I'll take baby downstairs. It's really important. And the London Pie Trust have got some fantastic information on it at the moment. There's a lovely video um, with a rugby player and talks about how important it is that we're all aware that if we hit a brick wall and we're absolutely exhausted, that we make that decision to put baby down in a safe environment. Um, it's very easy to put baby in position and you get comfortable on the sofa. Do you want to show to you, oh. Get comfortable on the sofa um, and put baby, you know, right up against you. They're nice and calm, they're nice and relaxed. 
and unfortunately babies don't have the ability to move themselves out of a complicated position so they can go underneath the armpit and then we've got risks of suffocation. So it's really important that we, we understand when we are at our breaking point and we're going to stop, catch our breaths, put our babies down, go and have a scream out the window if you need to, go and have a drink, a bit of fresh air and then come back ready to go again. So cluster feeding, should we talk a little bit about that? Cluster feeding is something that can happen sort of day three, day four, and can carry on quite a while with babies, is where these babies really want to feed constantly overnight. They want to be on you. They want to be faffing around. They're not really sure what they want, but they know that they don't want to be laid down. And that could be the hardest time for most mums and for dads, um, because baby just wants to be with you, doesn't want to be put down. So it's really key to work as a tag team, isn't it? And say, yeah. mummy's feeding, so Julie's just fed George. And then daddy can take baby, change nappy, um, have a cuddle, nurse, rock, stimulate, and then maybe put baby down if baby won't go down, see if mum's ready to take baby back. And between you, it's about that working together. And that's really important. And that's what's going to get you through in the first, first couple of weeks. So, okay. So we've talked about cluster feeding. Um, so we cluster feeding actually, in a way, during the day can be quite good as well. It's yeah. Down and yeah, and I think that's the thing is, you know, get everything in. So have all your meals in the freezer ready to go. Um, have a, a support network around you that you can phone somebody on tap to go and pick something up for you if you need to. And be prepared really just to camp out in your pyjamas for that first week. Mm. Visitors. Oh, <laughs> so everybody wants to see the new baby, don't they? They do. But for you, it's really important that you establish that little network between the two of you, three of you, or possibly four if it's twins. Um, and it's really sort of making sure that you guys are okay, the baby's not going anywhere, and these visitors can come at any point. But make sure that you get your time to rest. Make sure you get your time to establish feeding, whether it's formula feeding or breastfeeding. And the best people to be doing that are you guys. So, so not the neighbour, not the nanny, not the grandma, etc, etc, it's mummy and daddy, or partners. Um, so it's really important that you take that time just to say, actually, please leave us alone for at least 48 hours, let us get everything sorted, and then we'll let you know when we're ready for visitors. Interestingly enough, when Covid first all started, you, yeah. you think back, yeah. we had so few babies with weight loss problems. Yeah. And it's because nobody could go out, nobody could visit you, you couldn't go out. The world visit. stopped, didn't it? Yeah, yeah and we and did too. And it yeah. really was a joy. Um, slowly, it's getting back to, sometimes mums will come in and, oh, I've been so busy, I had visitors all day yesterday. You know, it is, yeah. they want to, I know they want to see you, but also it can be more stressful for you. So just think about the visitors. And lacking the message on the phone, we're all well but resting or on the door. Or... <laughs> yeah. So, and we could do a little bit about soothing a baby, couldn't we, really? Sort of that comes into that sort of early stages, mm -hmm. doesn't it? So, some babies will cry, and they will cry, and they will cry, and one they will cry. And other babies may not. And we worry more about the babies that actually are sleeping all the time than we do the babies that are awake and wanting you. So we say in the early stages, look at your care plan because your care plan tells you very clearly up to 72 hours how that baby performs. Um, they've been through labor, they're tired, but it's important that they do have some really good feeds. Um, we're looking at the poos, we're looking at the wheeze. And then when we sort of get to day five, and after that 72 hours sort of period, they really come into themselves. Now, we talked about jaundice earlier, so if this baby's got jaundice, we probably need to be a bit more hands-on and wake them a little bit. Um, I don't know if any of you out there watching have heard about a milk drunk baby. So a milk drunk baby is one that pretty much comes off the breast or after feeding by bottle and literally just does that. <laughs> and they are full to the brim and you can see them and they come off and they're heavy. And, you know, they really just want to be laying down. They don't want to be feeding anymore. But, you know, if a baby's jaundice in them early days, that baby with jaundice often shows signs of that. So what we would want to be doing is being a bit more hands-on. 
So if your baby has been sleeping for a great length of time, what would we say, four hours plus, yeah. we would want to make sure that we're getting that baby up and waking them and putting them on a changing mat and changing their nappy. And we know, we see it from here, don't we, that often if we just put a baby on a changing mat, all of a sudden they're, I don't know, what's going on? And they'll wake up and then we can start feeding. And that's really important in the early days that we keep putting baby skin to skin and putting baby to the breast because it tells that breast messages that are really important to make sure that that supply comes in really well. So, so we've done our support, haven't we? We've mm -hmm. talked about signs of feeding. Um, what about a baby that's crying all the time? Have you got any tips, Julie, on soothing a baby when it's crying all the time? When the baby's crying all the time, I think the best thing is skin to skin. But there are so many different reasons why they'll be crying. And you'll find that you might go through them all and then you'll be starting and going through them all again. Should we go through some feeding, of them things? Feeding the baby. So they could be hot, they could be cold. Their nappy could be full. Yeah, so they could be stools or they could be urine, couldn't mm -hmm. they? They could be led in the Moses basket on their own. And when a baby's inside you, it's like that. In a nice warm, protected bubble, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, it's got arms and legs that are free to move and wake it and startle it. Yeah. So it's quite scary for them. And if you think about monkeys, monkeys carry their babies around and they permanently have them on them and they feed on tap and they're there and they're safe and they're protected and they're warm. And these new babies are no different. But what we do find is that some babies are the complete opposite. They'll go down in their Moses baskets and mums think, well, hey, I've got a really, really good baby here. But actually, we want you to do the opposite because babies that sleep really well are probably missing them feeding cues mm -hmm. and probably may end up having a bit of a weight loss. So we want to make sure we err on the side of caution. Now, also, if your baby's had a bit of a complex delivery, so if they've been um, a forceps delivery or a Ventus, they might have a headache, mightn't mm -hmm. they? So they might be a little bit uncomfortable and that skin to skin and that feeding is going to help them to feel nice and comfortable and safe and breast milk. All the smiles yeah. and sounds they've had for nine months. Yeah. Next year is what they find secure for them. Now, Julie's at home with her baby and I've come round to see her because I'm really excited to see her new baby. And then Julie's sister has come round to see her at home, and then her auntie's come round, and then the other work colleague has come round, and then the lady down the road has come round. And this baby has been handled and passed around and around and around. That's another reason why a baby might cry. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know who yeah. the comfort's coming from. Overstimulated. Yeah, overstimulated. So sometimes it's just a case of putting Smart. that baby down, isn't it? Allow it to have five minutes, catch its breath, and what you may find, if that baby's nice and comfortable, it may go off to sleep by itself. So, where would we put a baby down to sleep? We wouldn't put a baby next to a radiator, would we? We wouldn't put a baby next to an open wide window. We don't really want any drafts. We wouldn't want a baby next to a fan. Um, and we wouldn't we, want a baby at the top of the pot. No, we wouldn't. No, and we wouldn't want the baby. Realistically, we don't want the baby in the middle of the bed with us, with us both fast asleep, because um, it'd be very easy for baby to go underneath the covers or for us to roll onto baby. So there's some good recommendations about safe sleeping. Um, so you can do your investigation about that, or you can ask your midwives for any further support. Also, the Lullaby Trust has got it on there as well. Um, so we talked about. Headaches, haven't we? We've talked about the fact that overstimulation, wet nappy. What about how do I know if my baby's poorly? So how do I know that things aren't going well? Um, temperature. Yeah. Um, your baby may have a rash. Um, you know, there's lots of things that we're looking at. Now, babies do get little rashes in the early days. Um, I see we've got a question pop up, so we'll answer that in a second. Um, they do get little rashes, they can get little pimples, they're touching our bodies, aren't they? And sort of, you know, sometimes they can be a little bit blotchy from that. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at is the whole picture. Is this baby's rash getting worse? Has this baby got a temperature? Is this baby's stools changed? Is this baby really fractious? We're looking at the whole picture. Are you, are you, are you humbling the baby? Yeah. The tone of the baby? So we would always refer that back to someone, wouldn't we? So we would either speak to the midwife or we'd speak to the GP. Uh, we'd make sure that we're checking in. Right, okay, so let's have a look at and see what this question is then. 
Hi ladies, I would like to ask you a question about other people kissing my baby. Everyone just wants to hold her and kiss her, and um, those sweet little cheeks, but I don't like that, and feel uncomfortable when they do that. How to nicely tell them to not do it? Do I sound like I'm protective over a baby? Not, not at all. <laughs> no, not You're at all. You're really calm, and especially with kissing. She's your baby, and you know, you're, you're her world. You've really got to protect her because you can't say it herself. And we're in very difficult situations at the moment, aren't we? So we're wearing masks when we're out and about. And then if you've got people coming to your house and, you know, their friends, etc., etc., they probably are not wearing masks. So it is a very protective time for you, understandably you're concerned. I think everybody understands if you say that, actually, you know, this baby's very precious to me. Um, I really would appreciate at the moment that you just don't. You know, I love the fact that you've come to see me, um, but I really just don't want you to kiss my baby. I hope that's helped a little bit. <laughs> um, and I hope you guys can all hear us all right out there. You just ping us a message just to let us know that you can hear us clearly. So, it's one of the questions we get asked quite a bit at the moment is, how do we know if um, I'm dressing my baby right? How do I know if it's too hot in the room? Um, what do I do when I go out and about? And it's a real hard one, isn't it? Because we are struggling in this heat alone, just being in a unit and we've got a fan going. So for a newborn baby, it's really difficult. They want to feed more often because they want to quench their thirst. So you may find that babies feed for five minutes at a go quite often because they really just want to be on you. Um, but then you've got the difficult situation of the fact that you're hot, you're sweaty, you're then they're making them hot because you're regulating their temperature. It's a really tricky one, isn't it? So we always say if you're feeding, most definitely, take baby down to a nappy because you're hot, your hormones are high, and actually your skin to skin is going to warm that baby up anyway. Um, if you're concerned at all and you've got a fan on in the room, you can always drape a muslin cloth across baby just to keep them you know, a bit more warmer. Um, putting them down is another tricky one, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, oh, yeah. um, we've had babies that have come into the unit today. I think it's probably one of the hottest days today, isn't it, at the moment? Mm -hmm. And babies have been coming in with just vests and nappies, um, and that's fine. Um, it's the giraffes that you're looking for. So if it's a bit windy outside, then you obviously would want something over baby. Um, never hats. Um, when babies are delivered, we more often than not will put a hat on baby, but it's really important that you know that when you're out and about and it's cold, that baby probably needs a hat, but as soon as you step inside that house, take them outdoor clothes off, take a hat off. Babies lose heat through their head, and they have no way at the moment of telling you that they're hot and bothered, but they will lose it through their head or through their, you know, their body from not having too much on them. So, yeah, it is a very tricky time for us all. Mm -hmm. um, layers, I think, is better than actually wrapping them up all too tight. So, things over them that are very thin. So, there's a blanket here. You can see it's got a lot of holes in it. So, it's a very lightweight blanket. So, that could just go across baby at the bottom so that we've got baby's arms out. Baby's arms are on mummy's skin. And, um, yeah, it's just really a close check. We would never check baby's hands or feet because baby's hands or feet tend to be a bit more colder. Um, the back of the neck or the chest. Um, and as I said to you again, always keep the head uncovered. Have we got any more questions? Oh, you can hear us clearly. Thanks for that, Emma. Brilliant. Um, is there anybody out there that have got anything they would like to ask? We are well winded it through here, aren't we? Any questions? No? Okay. Should we go back to the cord? So what would you do if actually on day five you knocked that cord clamp and it started bleeding? So we had this happen the other day and the mum was quite upset and distressed about it and was really worried. Now, the cord clamp is attached in such a way that it is clearly sealing that cord off and sometimes, yes, they can just be knocked off. Um, sometimes they can bleed a tiny bit and that's absolutely fine. What we're looking for is that eventually that, that dries up. So we wouldn't really want that blood to continue to flow, to continue to flow. If it did, then obviously give us a ring, have a chat with us and see if you want us to have a peek of it. How do we know if it's an infection? They smell foul, don't they, Julie? Yeah, really foul. 
Um, they also have, can have a redness above or they can have a redness below. Um, and as we said, these will pop off at any point. Now, when they come off, that belly button is quite open, it's quite raw, and sometimes it can have a tiny little bit of pus in it. And what happens is it goes in on itself, it covers over nicely, it dries out, and sometimes they'll have a little tiny scab on the top. And we don't have to do anything with them, we can completely leave, leave them alone. Um, eyes. Eyes can very often be quite gloopy in the early days. Um, the tear ducts are very underdeveloped and it takes a little while really for them to get to use their eyes efficiently. So sometimes we'll see a little bit of gloop or what looks like a little bit of conjunctivitis. Um, we're keeping an eye on that as well, so we're making sure that that disappears. Breast milk. Breast milk's fantastic for it, isn't it? So if we drop a tiny little bit of breast milk in the eye, fantastic. Other than that, we can use some cold boiled water on a little bit of cotton wool and we can just give the wipe across with one eye and a wipe across on the other side. We never go backwards and forwards, so we're literally just wiping one way or the other. Um, so we've covered eye care, we've covered cord care. Um, what, should we bath this right. baby in the first week? What do you think? I would rather not. Me too, yeah. We so did use to. We did, yeah. But uh, the recommendation is furnaces on the skin when they're born are so protective for them. And it soaks into the skin so, beautifully, yeah, it doesn't it? The skin and yeah. just leave it like that. If you really, really need to bath your baby, just plain water and make sure you cut, especially the cord area, cut it dry. It's best to leave her. So we call it topping and tailing, don't we? My mum used to call it a lepin, I promise. But <laughs> topping and tailing. So really what we're doing is we're getting some warm water on some cotton wool and we're literally just giving the areas that are the most important bits to give a bit of a clean. So the areas... Under all these, under the neck. All, all the creases under the neck. Where the milk seeps. Behind, yeah. behind the ears. All these creases. The hands sometimes because they grab your hair. Yeah. Yeah. Under the armpits. And the armpits, and they can get quite red and sore, so it's best in the groin area. And yeah, anywhere where there's the feet creases, in between the toes. Yeah, anywhere there's creases, just have a little look. Keep your arm those. So we've not gone into any great detail about baby care, as in nappies, have we? Um, so with little girls, we always want to go from front to back because we don't want to take the risk of infection. So we recommend cotton wool and warm water in them early days. So we can literally triple a little bit of drop of water on the front of the vagina and we can just literally wipe from front to back. Um, babies like us women do secrete discharge. So we don't need to go inside the vagina. It passes out as a natural process. Um, so that's quite normal. Um, little girls can sometimes often have swollen breasts because they are carrying over the hormones from mum. Um, they have been known to secrete a little bit of milk and they can be quite hard, can't mm -hmm. they? Quite swollen. Yeah, um, also the vagina can be quite swollen and with little boys the same too. So little boys can have swollen breasts, they can also have swollen scrotums um, and sometimes um, they can pass a little bit of milk from the nipple as well. So there's lots of little things that are going on with your baby that um, it's really important that you're aware of this before you have it so it's not too scary for you. Um, we have a really good support network out there, so there's always somebody to call, there's always somebody to ask. Um, with the community-led units, there's always somebody around the clock to speak to. Um, and also at the John Radcliffe, there's um, somebody there all the time to speak to there. Um, questions. Okay. Hey ladies, please can you confirm how I can be sure my baby's having enough quality milk on each feed? Recently, baby has been feeding more regularly for less time, also looking restless on and off the nipple, throwing his head this way and that. Thank you in advance. Can we talk to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, constant feeding. Um, don't say how old your baby is, Kelly. Um, yeah, so sometimes in this weather, babies want to feed more often because they're getting watery milk. It quenches their thirst. Um, as a baby got jaundice, we'd want to know that because that can affect the way that babies are feeding sometimes. And also, have you always had a good attachment? Is this something new? Um, the other question is, have you introduced a bottle? Um, is it about the flow? Is the baby managing to take the bottle really quickly, but then when the baby's going on the breast, um, it's really struggling and having to work hard for you? Um, like with us, it's really hard to work. At the moment, we're hot, we're bothered. 
bones are the same, you know, they get exhausted, they're hot, they, you know, they're on you. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'd need a few more questions, Kelly. Um, we can always direct you to the infant feeding team as well if you're having feeding issues. Um, okay. They could just be having a growing spurt. 38 weeks gestation, okay, so, so nearly cooked. <laughs> um, and how, how old? Three weeks, okay. So yeah, so feeding can change. Lots of going on. Yeah. And you, you know, your body is very clever. So that, um, that is most feed. definitely something the infant feeding team will be able to support you with at three weeks. Um, they are on, on the John Radcliffe website and you can speak to them. They also have their live feeds. Um, so you can see on the Oxfordshire Maternity Voice Partnership group that they're on once a week with their hour and you can actually ping a message on there. Um, I think really at the moment it's probably heat. <laughs> born at 32 weeks and six. Oh, bless you, congratulations. Mm -hmm. So, little dot then. So you're doing well. So we've come quite far then from 32 weeks. Well done, but yeah, seek advice. Always if something's not quite as it has been, always get help. Fantastic. Lovely, how are we doing for time? So we've got a little bit more time. Any more questions out there, guys? So we have seen you up to day 10 ordinarily and what we like to do is try and fit you in for your last appointment to see the midwife that has been the midwife that's been caring for you for your post your, your natal journey and um, we do try and make sure that we do that sometimes the midwives are on annual leave and we can't facilitate that so we normally try and do it to another midwife that you've seen um, during that time if we needed to see you a bit longer, then we may keep you on the books for a bit longer. Um, and we also make sure that the health is as informed that we've got you and that we are getting ready to discharge you. Now, the other thing that we will do, do sometimes is we also work with the health visitors, don't we? So sometimes we may still be seeing you. We may be doing a, a check before you go off to your prolonged jaundice appointment if you've got one booked. Um, so we may see you here, but we also, you may also see your health visitor. That's absolutely fine. It doesn't matter that we're both seeing you um, and we feed between us to make sure that everybody knows exactly what's going on. Okay, another question. How do I know if baby has diarrhea? Yeah, that's a very tricky one too as well, isn't it? Yeah, because the milk can be very, uh, the poos can be very grey um, because of the richness of your milk. They can be very watery, they can be explosive. They yeah. can be, they can be smears. All things like that. A bit more concentrated. Yeah. Um, if you've eaten something that's extremely spicy, then sometimes mm. that can sort of slightly change the way the poo is. Um, it's really difficult to know, I know. Um, what we're expecting is, is if that baby is breastfed, did you say, Emma? Um, I don't think you did. Um, uh, Francis, sorry. Um, no, I don't think Francis has said. Um, Formula fed babies, their poos are slightly different to breastfed babies, and breastfed babies' poos are very seedy. So as you can see in that yellow, that is the fat content in the nappy, so we expect that. So if you're seeing a real change, or if that poo has gone to green, or it's not quite as it was, then always seek help from your midwife, or your GP if we've discharged you. Oh, we're getting lots of questions now, look. Okay, so how often after the first couple of weeks should you wash them? Well, um, once you're bathing them, that would take a lot of the top and tailing in a way. Yeah. Um, but yes, at least twice a day, you say, morning and night, and if you're not bathing them. I'd actually, I'd, say, I'd probably say less. I think these babies are a little bit peely, aren't they, to begin with? They look a little bit like chameleons. Yeah. And the, the difficulty is, is that the more we bath them, the more they peel. Um, and the baby's skin has got to get used to the outside world. It can also be quite stressful, can't it, bathing a baby? Um, so it's making sure that you've got everything around you, making sure you've got doubles of everything, can guarantee they'll have a wee or a poo while you're just getting them in the bath. Um, I think the recommendation is at least once a week. Yeah, it? definitely. But for yeah. washing them, certainly I would, because of all these creases, and babies don't sweat, weather. do they? They don't yeah. sweat. They don't get too Just messy and dirty like we do. And, yeah. and, see what like. and the other thing is, you know, warm water. We don't need to overload their ba the baby's skin with products. So get used to getting this baby in and out of the bath without it being slippery. So just warm water in the early days just to make sure. And then if you introduce anything, introduce it very slowly um, and make sure that that baby doesn't develop a rash because a lot of these products will say newborn, but actually we know 
they've got a lot. They've, they've got, got a lot more, more in them, so it's probably best not to. Ah, oh, Francis has come back. With the diary in question, Bailey's exclusively breastfed and his game masters away. Fantastic. Nine weeks old. Still has white nappies too, but he poos with every feed. About eight dirty nappies per day. Poos are liquid. I think I'm definitely going to re refer you on to the infant feeding team for that one. They are the gurus and they are most definitely the best person to help you as your baby's that much further on. Um, so yes, good luck with that, Francis. Um, the heat does affect the way babies poos. Um, and if your baby's feeding more often as well, because it's, you know, it's wanting that fluid, that, that probably is another reason for it. But yeah, run it by them. They're, they're lovely on the infant feeding team. Fantastic. Also, the health visitors, I think most health visiting team now have got a breastfeeding specialist on board yeah. in their yeah. team. Fantastic. Okay. Have we missed anything? Ah, oh, nappy sacks. Can we talk about nappy sacks? Mm, yeah. We'll talk about nappy so, so a lot of people have probably got these nappy sacks and what we do say is if you've got a box of nappy sacks, get one out, keep the others well away. At the moment we probably lots of us have got our windows open and there could be a bit of a draft. It's very easy as these bags are very, very lightweight to fly about as you can see. Now they're, they're, they're perfect. <laughs> as you can see, if you've got other children and they've been playing with them, that air catches that nappy sack and it goes across to baby. If baby was lying on its back and we hadn't, we hadn't walked into the room at that right moment, that would be very easy for the baby to suffocate because baby hasn't got the ability to know to, to remove that from its face. So I would always be really careful with nappy sacks and make sure you just get the one out to dispose of your nappy and then put them away. Fantastic. Um, what else are we looking at? So we've talked about... Um, the care plan, haven't we? We said about how important this is. Um, it's, the yeah, and the red book. So we've got the red book and we keep that and we put every time we weigh your baby, we record it in this red book. This red book goes all the way through your baby's life. Um, even when they're teenagers, we're recording in it and putting immunisations and um, vaccinations that they've had. And also your health visitor will document in that too. But this one is really for the first 14 days when we're seeing you, or slightly longer if we have to. Um, we're making sure that each time we're seeing you, we're going through all the checks for you to make sure that everything is well with you. So for example, we've got um, how are your breasts feeling? So is there any nipple damage? Um, are your breasts engorged? Um, have you felt your milk come in? Are they sore? How are you feeling in yourself? Um, your tummy, how's your tummy feeling? You might have had a C-section, you may need a bit of midwifery input, um, you may have a wound, we may need to have a look at that for you. Your legs, we're always asking you about your legs. Mm -hmm. um, your legs, it's, it's your higher risk of thrombosis and blood clots, so it's making sure you've got no pain in your calves, um, making sure that everything's settling. Um, a lot of women that we see probably are having fragment injections, so it's making sure that you're happy with doing that and you've got somewhere to dispose of it. Have you had stitches? So we're checking whether or not you've had sutures, how it's feeling, if you need that looked at, if you've had a look yourself. <laughs> um, not many mums want to, do they? But, you know, put a mirror down there, have a look. Also your blood loss. So we're looking to see, is that starting to slow down? Are you passing any clots? Um, how are you feeling in yourself? Have your bowels open? Are you passing urine? Um, are you knowing when you need to go for a wee? Um, how's your mood? It's always a bit of an odd question to ask you, but it's really important that you are letting us know if you feel that actually you've got a permanent black cloud over your head. If you have, then we need to, we need to work with you and make sure that we can get you some support for that and make sure that everything comes out sunny on the other side. Um, it's quite normal, as we said in them early days, isn't it, to feel quite overwhelmed and everything. For baby... Sorry, Julia? Pelvic, pelvic floors, yeah, we're checking that you're doing your pelvic floors, really important. Um, you may not think it at the time, but it's in later life that we really have to make sure. Um, jumping on trampolines and things like that and coughing and sneezing. So really important though, you know, although it doesn't seem like something that's really important in early days where everything's really tender, it is really important because it's, we reap the rewards if we do it long term. Baby care, so we go through the weight, as we said, we go through... What does the colour of the baby look like? Is there a hint of jaundice there? Um, is the baby pink? Um, how are the baby's eyes? What does the cord look like? Um, what colour stools are we at at the moment? We said about that pathway, the meconium, the brown sticky poo, going to the green. 
brownie and then the yellow which is a bit like chicken korma how many wet nappies are we getting how is the feeding going so really important that we look through these care plans then we've got another question haven't we yeah. on day seven exclusive breastfeeding baby in the last day has been very sicky after every feed is this normal nappies are still normal and i definitely feel like i have too much milk could baby be taking too much hello taylor i recognize that name yep yeah. so probably we are day seven give us a call and we'll have a chat about it after the live feed um it's really sort of seeing how things are going with you um it is very hot as we've said so these babies probably are feeding a bit more often um yes if they posit after they've had a really good feed sometimes that's quite normal um but is there anything else going on has the baby got a temperature has the baby got any change to its stools are you worried about anything else has the baby got a rash um you know babies will feed and we are watching them sucking and swallowing and it's really important that we're watching that and we do push them to keep going and keep going so that they get a really really good feed like a three course meal with the pudding being the best bit of it but sometimes they do take a little bit more and that's quite normal is it projectile or is it just a tiny bit babies often posit a little bit you haven't said taylor okay so if you're concerned at all please do give us a ring we can have a chat about it fantastic 10 minutes. Anything else? Yeah, should we go through? The red book. The red book. Um, yeah. Where it's listed for all the, what we're yeah. taking the blood for. We've got yeah. Back line. So, in your red book, as we said, you get to keep this for the rest of your baby's life. There's actually a lot of information in it. First check. Yeah, we've got first yeah. check. So, your initial newborn check, we didn't talk about that. No. So when your midwife um, comes out to see you for the first visit, within that first 72 hours, they do something called a newborn check. They may have done it at the hospital, so and you may not have even been aware of it. But what they're doing is they're looking in baby's mouth, they're looking in baby's eyes, they've done the hearing test, they're looking at baby's spine, they're checking that baby's got 10 fingers and 10 toes, they're checking that everything's developing well and that there's no concerns. They then record it in your red book, um, sometimes, um, if it isn't done at the hospital, it will be done by one of the midwives that's trained and it's called a night. Um, and if that midwife is night trained, she may come out and do it at your house or she may ask if you come up at, to somewhere in community and they'll do it there. So each time we've seen you, things are recorded in here. So I can see in this book that somebody's already started to fill this one in um, from old and this is a newborn examination and it's just checking everything. So we've got the examination of the eyes, examination of the heart, the testes in a boy, examination of the hips. If there was any concerns with anything else, then they'd be directing you as to what they do about it and whether or they need any further support. We also put your labels when we're doing the heel prick test in there. And we also make sure that we record any weights. There's also pages about meningitis and rashes and book start and places to get help and support. Um, the Department of Education, um, it's got screening pages in here. It also tells you about things that baby is doing at certain points. So in here it says first two months, your child eyes will be examined as part of the routine, routine baby review. Um, it says shortly after birth, a baby is started by a sudden loud noise, by one month, by four months. So it's really informative, isn't it? There's lots and lots of information in here. Um, we also have growth charts and we have a lovely page with pictures that says what your baby may be doing with their smile, etc, etc. Um, and also if your health visitor or any dentistry comes into it, there's a page about dental care and about when your baby may lose its first tooth or when your baby gets its first tooth. Um, a height conversion chart. Now somebody asked me the other day if I would measure their baby and we don't do that, do we? Uh, we don't we, we don't, don't measure, measure babies, babies um but we can we can always have tape measures here if, you, if that's something you would like to do yourself um weight we do on day five sometimes there's a need for us to do weight on another day so sometimes we have weighed babies on day three but as part of the trust the the ordinary bit is that we weigh you on day five um unless that baby is premature and needs a bit more support and a bit more help um another question right okay hi both Hi. Hi. Over the past week or so, um, Ottilie has been using the breast more as a pacifier 
then for milk, is this normal? She re will refuse the dummy. Yeah, quite normal. I mean, you know, babies are using you for comfort. They're using you for support. They, they're using you for stimulation. Um, they're making sure that um, they're working your milk supply. They're making sure that they're getting their drink. They're making sure that they get their meal. They're, they really just want to lay on you. Yeah, that's quite normal. It does get easier and it does get to the points where they will be put down. But in them early weeks, they really just want to be on you. Uh, we'll lay on the breast on and off, not eating in between feeds. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so basically Amy does, just doesn't want to be put down. <laughs> yeah, so that is quite normal. Um, as we talked earlier, I don't know if you caught, caught the first part of the feed, but most newborn babies behave like monkeys and monkeys will hang on to their mums for dear life and they just want to feed or just hang on them and be, be there. Um, inside, they've been listening to your heartbeat and that's been very therapeutic for them and that's what they can hear. And then when they come outside, they still want that. They want to be on you, they want to be comforted, they want to be able to have that sound. As we said, they've got arms that startle them, you know, they have got sounds, they've got smells. It's a big wide world and it's quite scary. And yes, they want to be protected. So, spoilt. We used to talk about this quite a lot in parent craft classes, Julie, didn't we? You can't, about the you fact can't spoil a baby. You yeah. You can't spoil a baby. Um, and it's such a precious time for you to make the most of all the cuddles. Um, it will make a much calmer baby and a much calmer mummy. Um, and long term routines can be put into place, but in these early days, it's really important that you respond to your baby. No, don't, um, try, don't try and get a routine. It won't work at the early days. Yeah. Later on, much chance um, it will, but not in the early days. And responsiveness works in both ways, doesn't it? So we talked about the babies that will go down in a crib and parents will say, I've got a really good baby. You know, actually, if you're aware that that baby hasn't fed for a while, get that baby up, have skin to skin, really make sure that it's feeding well. If you're unsure of whether or not that baby's feeding well, seek help. Let's, let's have a look. Let's, let us observe a feed with you. Um, you know, sometimes mums will say, oh, baby's feeding really, really well. But actually, if it's your first baby, how do you know if your baby's feeding really, really well? Well, there's lots of things that we can find out from a baby. So if a baby is feeding really, really well, it's going to have lots of wet nappies. If it's feeding really well, it's going to have lots of nice nappies with poos in it. Um, that baby's going to have patches where it's really, really wanting to feed, and then it's going to have patches where it has a little snooze. Um, so there's lots of signs. Um, a baby really needs for a good substantial amount of time. So if that baby's just having five minutes feed and then it's sleeping for four or five hours, that's not good. We want a baby that's really wanting to let you know and responding to your every move and telling you, I, I need you, mummy, um, or daddy, or partner, etc., etc., etc. So yes, it's a, a very hard, complicated time. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that you think, right, okay, I'm going to camp out in my pyjamas, I'm going to enjoy my baby, I'm going to sniff it, I'm going to smell it, I'm going to touch it, I'm going to talk to it, and we're developing that baby's brain while we're doing that, and that baby's going to respond to you beautifully, and a couple of weeks down the line, we'll forget about how hard it was, <laughs> and that's why we go on to have more, and more, and more. Has that been helpful? <laughs> so we just want you to enjoy yourself in the first few days with your baby, and we've all been here a long time. Yeah. So if you don't want to come in, that's fine. Give us a ring, we'll have a chat, and hopefully we can come up with a little suggestion between us to help. And no question is a daft question. We take calls all the time from anxious mums at home. We would much rather you rang us and we can answer that question for you on the phone rather than you sat at home worrying about it. It's really, really hot at the moment and everybody's uncomfortable and it can be really unbearable sometimes. So putting baby in a pram and actually taking baby for a walk and catching your breath for five minutes is really good too. So it is, it's making sure that you're looking at the whole picture and getting the support as and when you can. And we look forward to it. Mm -hmm. We look forward to seeing you all. So best of luck with your pregnancy or best of luck with how you're getting on with your new baby. We'll just check we haven't got any more questions. No, we haven't. 
We will look at this afterwards, so if there is any questions you've thought of, put them up on there and we'll try and get them answered for you. Um, I hope that's been helpful and we look forward to seeing you in the first couple of weeks of your baby's life. Take Bye. care. Bye.